Hey, Alex, how are you doing? I guess we're waiting for TJ to come and teach us what to do. Huh? I just had a really... You don't want to study in Virginia? You should go to University of Virginia. Now you could legitimately say, why do I think you should go to University of Virginia? But <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> I'm on the PhD committee for two students at University of Virginia, uh, Teen and Megan. Um, they have an incredibly good biomedical engineering school, uh, half of which is in their school of engineering, half of which is in the med school. So if you wanted to do an MD PhD, you can do it there. Um, and so TJ works with, and I both work with Teen, Pomacoglu is a Turkish uh, student who does both, who does Confucil and, and tissue forage modeling uh, of developmental biology. And then uh, Megan Haas, who, who's doing these very detailed model of, of muscle injury and re regeneration after injury. And I was just talking to a new grad student who's just starting, who's got a really neat project with NASA where they're looking at, at um, the muscle degeneration in space flight. And so what they want to understand is uh, how does how does recovery after injury change when you've been in microgravity? Um, and so they're taking Megan's model of recovery after injury in normal normal gravity, and then they're trying to understand what are the differences in the way that the tissue the, the muscle works. That is really interesting. Very sophisticated models are not there. They're some of the fanciest models anybody's done with copper. So, um, and then there's some other people there at, at, at Virginia who are just very good, who don't use CompuCell, but do the kind of things. There's a guy named um, uh, Kevin Janes, for example, does unbelievably elegant work on viral infection and immune response with beautiful models also. It's a, I mean, there are other very good MD PhD programs like Hopkins, but, but, but I'd say Virginia isn't quite as competitive to get into as Hopkins and the, the, the quality of the program is amazing. All right. Hello, everyone. Okay, TJ. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being willing to do this. You see, you have a, a enthusiastic audience here. <laughs> yeah, I uh, did not expect such a crowd. That's it's very exciting. It's good to see all. I haven't seen a few of you in a while. I also think I owe a few of you uh, <clears throat> software support email responses, uh, Michael. I was just saying, that, but while if we're waiting for anybody else to show up, I guess Hayden said he'd be a minute. Um, I was just on the phone with a, a new student in Virginia mm -hmm. uh, who's going to be continuing Megan's work on the muscle damage and recovery. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, mean. Yeah. And I was initially sort of nervous because she said, you know, "What parameters does CompuCell provide to dis to describe the muscle damage and 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 immune response?" <laughs> and I said, "Uh oh, this person knows nothing." No. But then she sat down. She showed me her slide deck, and she said, "Well, Megan has this sub model of of this cell of this immune cell type." Uh, 
uh, I want to change the following things because I know there's this change in insulin-like growth factor response. Uh, uh, in this case, I know there's this downregulation of chemotaxis of this. So, so she, she she basically mapped the whole problem already. There wasn't much to do except except look at it. But uh, uh, um, I thought it was uh, you know potentially if you if if Michael if you ever get that fiber plus CompuCell working, that's a place where they might want it because there actually there actually is ECM remodeling that potentially. Although I think those simulations are going to be so expensive, it's not going to be very practical for the kind of solutions. Okay, all right, great. Okay. Uh, are we waiting for anybody else? I think it looks like everybody's here. Um, Joel said he might come. Pedro said he was going to come. Lorenzo, Kyle, Hayden, Bart, Alex. Um, I guess I guess we could get started. I hate to say it, but I'm I'm going to be the the dummy. Well, I'm often the dummy, but I'm going to be one of the dummies here because I couldn't I couldn't get uh, the install to work for 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 uh, for tissue torture. That makes you the crash test dummy. <laughs> uh, I I actually troubleshooted that a bit. I think Tissue Forge is getting angry at CompuCell now because you can do it without CompuCell, and then you put four or five in it. It's you get the the boost error because one's looking for a specific Python and the other one doesn't like that Python. Anyway, let's let you, let's let TJ just start take it from the top. Sure, well, and I can address that real quick. So that's a that is a an erroneous limitation in the distribution of current CompuCell. So I have a request in the magic on this for really no reason at all. The Python version for CompuCell is pinned at three point Python three point ten, and there is no reason for that at all. Um, CompuCell will work on Python versions three point eight or greater, um, and that's the conflict. Yeah, um, Tissue Forge supports Python three point seven and greater. Um, and to make those two packages compatible, it requires a little bit of flexibility as far as selecting the <clears throat> the appropriate Python version. But yeah, pinning it at three point ten makes it problematic, at least on Windows. So the request is in. Um, I uh, so a part of CompuCell development that I do not manage. Well, let's let's get started. Mm -hmm. I don't know cool. what... Okay, so uh, I do. I do not intend to make this anything super formal um, to the extent that I am just going to work directly off of the slides that um, I used at uh, Combine and ICSB um, last uh, October. Okay. Oh, um, and, and to that, uh, and the first half of this slide deck is all just a, an overview of um, capabilities, modeling features, um, distribution details um, at kind of a, a, a high level. Um, <clears throat> and I, I left them in here for this um, really to leave it to you, James, as far as, you know, if you wanted to survey, um, you know, the, the main features that are being uh, sort of marketed, I guess, in the sales pitch type talks and, um, you know, survey sort of the current state of Tissue Forge, or um, if you want, we can skip right over all of that and just go straight to um, starting from a, a naive computer and ending with an interactive simulation of cell sorting. So why don't we why don't we do that? Why don't we actually make sure everybody can install and run Tissue Forge first? Sure. I would... I would like you to request to just burn through the slides first. So All right. All right. we have a, a common set of the state of what's going on, if possible. You can do it fast. Okay. Okay. I, I think I can talk to you talk through it without <clears throat> burning a, a ton of our time. Great. 
Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, we'll go through the installation details, so no need to um, worry about those details right now. <clears throat> um, here are some links, um, and I have these to put in the chat as well for everyone's reference. So uh, this is the link to the repository. This is where Tissue Forge is managed primarily. Everything, everything is birthed from the GitHub repo. So there's the link to that. Um, there's a link to the documentation for the project. Um, so this is everything from philosophy of the project to um, basic modeling features, um, notes on different um, examples, uh, code snippets, installation details, you name it. Quick walkthrough, getting started all the way to, um, you know, minutia on how to set the background color of a, a rendering window. Um, and then third one is linked to the uh, API docs for Python support. Uh, Issue Forge has user APIs in C, C++, and Python. Um, and yeah, there are the, that's a, a nearly complete um, documentation of uh, all of the, the Python API for Tissue Forge. Um, and <clears throat> those API docs are derived directly from the code. So um, that's a fluid document that evolves directly with releases of Tissue Forge. Um, and that's an outdated link. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're in PlosCon bio now, so you can ignore that. All right, so um, multi-physics, multi-scale, the, one of the most ambitious aspects of Tissue Forge is to support simulation all the way from the molecular scale uh, up to multicellular simulation. Um, and this is all primarily done, at least methodologically, through the abstraction of the particle, which is to say that particles really don't mean much per se, uh, and that their meaning is, um, is uh, imposed on a simulation uh, based on the properties of particles and uh, the interactions between them. Um, and this is maybe best demonstrated by just rattling off some of the different working examples that we have even in the distribution um, of uh, current tissue forge. We have simulations of fluid dynamics, solid mechanics, um, you know, molecular scale stuff uh, like uh, you know nucleobases, all the way up to you know cell sorting uh, with over a million cells. Um, that's uh, can get to the next slide. Yeah. Um, uh, another big um, ambitious aspect of Tissue Forge is to um, allow the same kind of flexibility that some of us are used to um, in terms of specifying like agent based models in CompuCell um, to try to uh, provide that, that same kind of. Uh, model development flexibility, but at the scale of particle dynamics. Um, so <clears throat> there's a, a sort of mixed uh, method approach to the way tissue forge simulations are specified. Much of uh, tissue forge model um, is implemented with um, a declarative specification where you describe things in declarative ways and tissue forge knows how to interpret that specification in terms of actual procedures that occur in the back end. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, um, the Tissue Forge design um, acknowledges that there is no well-defined, um, say, like standard specification for agent-based models. And uh, maybe more importantly, um, you know, there are very few people who actively develop this project and a nearly limitless amount of possible things that people might want to do in a simulation. And so there are features to allow users to inject procedural code into simulations, whether that um, those procedures, um, you know, whether they specify um, an agent-based model um, or say uh, data exporting and real-time analysis or 
uh, all sorts of things um, that support using tissue forge in very flexible, exotic ways for agent-based modeling, as well as um, in integrated applications as a library. Hmm. Uh, one of the other big <clears throat> features of tissue forge that push a lot is the interactivity. Tissue forge can function as a headless integrated library to execute simulations in the back end and just set it up to run, let it go and come back when it's done. Um, but Tissue Forge also supports bringing up an interactive window um, that executes and renders a simulation in real time and also is responsive to user interactions. Um, you can see an example of this in the top right. This is a <clears throat> screen capture of me just messing with a vertex model. Um, in Tissue Forge, it's not a, a set of features that we're going to discuss today, but what you can see is me clicking around in a simulation and also you notice that over time, um, these different objects in the simulation are changing and that's in response to events that I programmed into the simulation in Python to respond to clicks <clears throat> on my keyboard. So I'm actually changing this simulation in real time as it executes according to my keyboard. Um, and then browsing around um, as it continues to execute and uh, be visualized. <clears throat> There's uh, GPU support, um, dynamic G GPU support, um, in that uh, different features of Tissue Forge can be selectively offloaded onto available GPUs uh, and at runtime. Um, so if you have a big simulation um, that uh, would benefit from some GPU acceleration, you can just specify um, to offload certain interactions or certain procedures in the back end onto a GPU um, and say later, if your conditions are not so GPU optimal, you can just tell Tissue Forge then to just bring all the computations back to the CPU. Um, yeah. oh, does that support uh, the Apple M1 or M class uh, GPUs? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the... The, uh, the M1 processor is supported, um, but uh, all GPU acceleration is currently limited to CUDA supporting devices. That's a good question. <clears throat> like I said earlier, C, C++ and Python language support um, and building off the Python support and all of the interactivity, Tissue Forge supports um, interactive sessions in IPython or Jupyter Notebook. Um, which we can get into today. Um, so Tissue Forge simulations can be responsive to user feedback in a number of different ways. Um, and then there's lots of support for um, serial, serializing simulations or just model objects down to human readable JSON or then to binary data. Uh, so you can take whole simulations, make um, an image of it, uh, archive it, send it to a friend. You can do the same thing with different model objects where you can um, write a model object to file and then send that to someone who can then um, say recreate an instance of your object from the data you shared with them. Um, there's also 3D file format um, support. So you can take Tissue Forge simulations and uh, export data in such a way that um, that data can later be rendered uh, say in a, a browser um, and hosted posted on a web page. Uh, let's see what's next. Sorry, right, one second. Questions so far while we wait on PowerPoint to wake up? So again, the simulation output can be stored as a JSON file. Yes. Yeah, okay. And in, in the model itself, you said it was declarative. Can you save that to a regular text file or how is that saved? Or is that part of the JSON file? Yeah, so the JSON will encode okay. all of the backend data that results from your declarative specification. Yeah, so when you say 
declare like certain interactions between particles or types of particles that will result in uh, changes in the back end data. Um, and that data is then encoded in the actual export data. Um, yeah, LGPL uh, licensed. Uh, we'll go through at least a little bit of um, some of the distribution aspects. So there's a um, automated build from source um, to support developers getting uh, involved in to tissue forge. So to the extent that I can really guess what um, development environment a uh, developer might be working with, tissue forge often can um, correctly set up an entire build environment for a user um, with little to no uh, involvement on the user's part whatsoever. Um, all right, so um, here's an overview of the, um, you'd say, I guess, like the classes of, of I've never really known how to describe this, something like the classes of model objects, I guess. Um, so Tissue Forge <clears throat> uses an agent-based modeling approach um, where uh, a model will consist of um, a specification of a particle type, one or more types of particles. Um, and these Particle type definitions will include um, information about the kinds of particles um, that can correspond to that type. And what I mean by that is that a particle type definition will specify things like um, the mass of particles, um, radius, uh, you know, the name <laughs> of the type. Um, and these type definitions are used as factories for creating particles of that type. I think uh, an intuitive example, at least to me, is, is at the molecular scale. So um, with this uh, thymine instance that you see here in Tissue Forge, this definition, uh, the, the model specification here will define a hydrogen particle type, where all particles of the hydrogen type have a radius that corresponds to the hydrogen type. Um, same for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So you can have multiple instances of the same carbon particle type. And each of those instances are distinct, that they have their own position, and they have their own set of interactions, but they are all according to their type. Uh, and then Tissue Forge also has an additional layer in this hierarchy, which is uh, referred to as clusters. Um, and a cluster is an, an object that consists of other objects. There's a hierarchical specification here. The most obvious example being something like a molecule, where a molecule in Tissue Forge can be defined as a cluster that consists of multiple constituent atoms. The constituent atoms of the cluster are owned by the cluster, and there are ways to specify relationships and interactions depending on whether, say, two particles are in the same cluster or in different clusters. You can also calculate properties of clusters based on the properties of its constituent particles, so on and so forth. So I have a question. Yeah. You have a so so it looks like type is done the way I would say right as opposed to comp yourself which is in copy cell, if you define something at the level of a cell type, then in most cases, it's immutable at the level of the individual. Whereas here, it's 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 a template, but then it's over, you can override it. That's right. Uh, which is mm -hmm. what I think would be better to do in copy cell going forward. Uh, the other one though is uh, you have a concept of particle type. Is there an implemented concept of cluster type or meta cluster type? Uh, yeah, cluster type. So I have, so I can template a cluster, which would say the, the default version of this cluster has these components to it. That's right. 
uh so so the 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 type the type concept the the pattern the pattern instance uh concept is is consistent at the at the different scales that's right right thank okay. you All right, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, two different types of particle dynamics, uh, Newtonian dynamics for more smaller scale molecular dynamics type simulation or uh, over damped Langevin type uh, dynamics um, for more of cellular and multicellular um, scale simulations. Um, I don't wanna get into this. I think probably this is either mostly irrelevant or mostly obvious for everyone here. So we'll just keep on trucking. Um, interactions between particles can be defined at a number of different levels. Um, but uh, interactions and I guess processes in general acting on uh, particles to cause uh, changes in state occur through either uh, potentials that have implicitly defined forces or through uh, forces that are explicitly described. Um, and these different interactions can be specified at either the level of types of particles or by explicit sets of particles. And this is what I mean by that. So one can say that particles of two different types interact via a potential can say that um, you can declare that particles of say type A interact with particles of type B according to some potential. And tissue forward will just uh, work out the computations um, and determine you know, what particles interact according to that declaration um, during simulation. Or one can choose a specific set of particles, whether it's um, uh, say interactions between two particles or three or four and can say that these two or these three or these four particles, they all interact according to a particular potential. Um, in Tissue Forge, we call these kinds of explicit interactions bonds for two particle interactions, angle for three particle interactions, and dihedral. This is really taken from sort of some of the uh, the OG molecular dynamics um, simulators. Um, but there's a, a fundamental difference between assigning an interaction between particles by type or by explicit sets of particles. Um, and either way, those interactions are specified according to a potential function. Um, in tissue forged potentials and forces are actual programmatic objects that have an underlying uh, mathematical expression that they implement. Um, and in general, having a potential object um, in a tissue forged simulation, one can uh, assign interactions with that potential on the basis of types or, or bonds. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility with potential function or potential objects in general, and that one can use uh, a, a pretty extensive list of built-in potential functions, like a Moore's potential, Leonard Jones, like a hooky and spring type potential. There are lots of available built-in potentials, but users can also uh, specify their own potential um, just writing a Python function. So you can write a Python function that is an implementation of your specific potential um, function equation and then give that Python function to TissueForge and say, build a potential object out of it. <clears throat> and additionally, you can also add potentials together to create all sorts of different combinations of interactions. Um, so if you have two potential objects and you want to say have interactions that consider both of those as like a linear summation of processes. You can just add them together and then assign the resulting object. Um, yeah, for whatever interactions you might wanna prescribe. Uh, we do fluid dynamics using dissipative particle dynamics. Um, often I hear this described as getting convection for free. 
<clears throat> which is to say that Tissue Forge supports the idea of assigning something like cargo to individual particles, something like a, a scalar valued um, datum um, that is carried along with a particle <clears throat> and that scalar valued something, whatever it is, can diffuse between particles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as an example, to make this more concrete here on the right, this is a simulation of something like a classic um, thermal conduction or like convection problem in uh, undergraduate mechanical engineering. Um, so you have fluid flow. Those are the particles that you see moving around. So those are particles that represent parcels of fluid according to dissipated particle dynamics. And each of those particles has a temperature. The temperature being the scalar valued quantity that is either carried or associated um, with each of those particles. And then in the middle there, you see one big blob that's not moving at all. This is a heat sink. So each of these particles is initialized with some non-zero value of temperature. There is a particle that's fixed at the center of the simulation <clears throat> with a constant temperature of zero. And then there is diffusion between the particles between each other and with the sink as the fluid flows by the sink. And you can see a gradient builds up um, due to heat transfer from the fluid into the sink. All right, that's it. So I guess just if we're going to do that, there are a couple of things. Is there a concept of a field on a lattice, or is the field are fields only implemented through particles? Only implemented through particles. Okay, fine. <clears throat> and uh, and um, the second question I had was, are there intrinsic concepts of something like a or a, like a polarization or planar polarity vector? I know you did some simulations which did that, so that I could define the cells as being ellipsoidal or having shapes where I can have a potential function depend not only on the positions of the particles, but also on the or the internal state or or the internal state's orientation of the particles. Yeah, there so there is a um a built-in model extension. Not built <laughs> built in extension. There is uh, uh an extension that's distributed with tissue forge um that is that implementation you're referring to. Um, which there was, let me jump back. We, we actually saw this. Uh, this. This is the animation was slowing down the slide. So this will take a second to load. Um, so there is no built in, um, say, like, polarized anything on a tissue forge particle definition. Um, but as you can see in this simulation here on the right, it is uh, definitely possible to add a model feature like that in um, the support for procedural specification um, to the extent that tissue forge does have support for rendering directional like vector quantities. Um, so the simulation that you see here on the right, this is the model module that um, you're referring to. Um, all of the actual directional potentials and this state vector or set of state vectors that are assigned to each particle. So all of that is implemented in this uh, model extension and then um, that extension uses built-in rendering support for visualizing these kinds of quantities. Because because EpiSim as a package had pretty sophisticated uh, concept of um, elongated cells, squamous cells, and so on um, to do cell interactions and and also for also fit visualization rendering of of cell shapes. Yeah. That, I mean, it's fine if it's not there yet, but it might be interesting to think about those if they're not there as extensions. Uh, those are those have some some power 
uh, to, to at least to, in terms of communication, even if they're uh, something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, cool. So let's uh, let's start the crash course. Um, can I assume that everyone has Miniconda installed? Everyone who wants to actually do this. Let's put it this way. If you don't have many condensed, I'll speak up because we better we're gonna be have a long afternoon if you don't. <laughs> Let me I did some rearranging my computer. I think I ago. have phone die and installed before uh Tish Forge on an environment uh, with Python 3.9. So that should be set up, but that's where I am at. What's the command to check? Maybe that's the quickest way. Uh, you just do like conda dash h in a terminal. If it's not installed or properly set up, you'll get an error that the command conda is not recognized. Well, it's taking forever. Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah, I've got it kind of. Cool. Okay, so uh, let's just- Alex, start. Alex, Kyle, Bart. Yes. Bart, you all got it? Yes. Cool, all right. Just uh, as a- uh, I, I answered in the chat, yes. Just as a quick note, I was using the Tissue Forge Read the Docs install, is that- similar to this or slightly different uh it's the same okay yep i mean there there may be some thing you know some variations in the names of variables or whatever but the, the process or the procedure is the same okay yeah so the i mean the the basic idea is create a new conda environment install tissue forge into it That's oh it. okay All right, so let's walk through those steps. Uh, so if you open a terminal and you can confirm that you can use Conda in that terminal, um, then the first step that we'll do is we will create a new Conda environment into which we will install Tissue Forge. This is the fastest, most reliable way to install a Conda package in general. Certainly true for, for installing Tissue Forge. So open a terminal, no matter what operating system you're on, you should be able to type conda create dash in, and then just specify a name for your new environment. Okay, and so this is in my command prompt or should I be opening mini conda and doing it in mini conda? Uh, command prompts. Okay, fine. I think you can do this in a mini conda terminal as well, but command prompt should work all the same. Okay. Does location matter here? Nope. Nope, just the name. <clears throat> okay. So do you, oh, okay, okay. Sorry. So I get, okay, I'm sorry. I know I have mini conda because I launched it, but if I type conda create in in my command in, in my command prompt, I get a uh conda's not recognized. Okay, then probably for you. Use the mini conda terminal. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So conda, can you can you all see this? Yeah. Can... Conda create dash in, and I'm just gonna say tf underscore demo. Jag. It's going to be the name of my environment. And hit return, and that'll just create a new environment. It'll be empty, nothing interesting in it, but it's clean and ready to have stuff installed into it. 
Okay, it asks where to put it. It asks where? It says um, environment location. It gives me an option. So so I, I do conda create and dash n my environment. It says collecting package metadata, JSON. And then it says environment location, and then it gives me C, Glacier, my name, Miniconda, environments, my environment. And it says, do I want to leave it at that? Do I want to leave that as the location? Okay. Oh, like this? Yes. Yeah, you can just press yes. Okay, sorry. Yours, uh, yours, your, I was, yours just hadn't done it yet. My, yeah. Mine did it fast. Okay. Uh, Hayden, I think... For the open SSL errors, you have to disable SSL often, uh, SSL verify. Yeah, well, this is saying that open SSL appears to be unavailable on this machine. Open SSL is required to download and install packages. Would I not get SSL at some point? How about everybody else? Is it is it getting? Is this working for everybody else? Yes. Kyle? Alex? Um, Hayden, you can temporarily disable SSL verification in um, your Conda config. I've seen this one before. Um, <clears throat> you should be able to get around this using what I just put in the chat. I recommend after we're done with this, uh, reversing this command by replacing false with true. All right. So if you've got a fresh Conda environment, uh, whatever you named it at, the next step uh, with Conda in general is to activate that environment to do stuff with it. And you do that by the command Conda, activate, and then just the name of the environment. Mine was TF underscore demo underscore JAG. And if you were successful, then you should see that your terminal now has a modification where the name of your environment is specified in parentheses before the path to your current working directory. All right, and if everyone is there and has their new Conda environment activated, then just the next thing is to install Tissue Forge into it. The command is shown on the slide. And we're just gonna issue that command verbatim. And if you're at all interested in what this command means, it says Conda install using the channels Conda Forge and Tissue Forge. Using those channels, install the package Tissue Forge. So Tissue Forge is distributed on the Tissue Forge Conda channel, and most of its dependencies are distributed on the Conda Forge channel. And if you run that, <clears throat> then it'll it'll start thinking. And if all goes well, then it'll come up with a plan for all the stuff it needs to install and we'll ask you to confirm. While we're waiting, has anyone lost? 
Everyone good? Well, my OpenSSL thing is still causing problems. Even after changing the, uh, yeah, I don't know what to do about that at the moment. That's okay. You guys keep going. I'll just follow along. The slides seem to be pretty comprehensive to try again later. If I can get it fixed, I'll try to catch up. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, on success, uh, you should get a whole list of all the stuff involved with getting Tissue Forge to work on your computer. And most importantly, a request uh, to confirm that you'd like to proceed with this installation. And you just press Y to confirm. And then it does it. Okay, well, this time the install worked for me. I don't know why when I did it with uh, Michael, it failed. That's great. Now, I don't have Jupyter Notebook as a dependency of Tissue Forge. Yeah. <clears throat> so Tissue Forge does have native support for Jupyter Notebook. Um, but Jupyter Notebook is not a dependency of Tissue Forge. You know, so for people who don't want to use Tissue Forge in a Jupyter Notebook, they can just ignore those features altogether and don't even have to install it. But sorry, give me just like um, but uh for those of us who would like to use Tissue Forge in a Jupyter Notebook, um, we'll go through an additional step of installing um Jupyter Notebook and a couple of additional notebook specific libraries to use all of the additional bells and whistles that Tissue Forge has for Jupyter. Anyone getting any catastrophic failures besides Hayden? No. No, it's it said done and gave me the command prompt back. There's one thing on the Tissue Forge, read the docs, getting Tissue Forge uh, page. It doesn't explicitly remind you to set your Conda environment before installing. Oh, okay. And I'm I think sure that's what the problem was. In other words, when I didn't do that, it probably was trying. It was was pulling the compu the CompuCell dependencies. Wow, yeah, I'm suspecting, but it's it's a little different than what you have on your PowerPoint. Yeah, I would say in general that the PowerPoint is clearer in the sense that you you don't have any options. You just have a set of exact set of things to do. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> yeah, the the instructions for installing the the conda packages is a little more general because the installation is not restricted to just installing into new environments. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, we uh, like at Combine last year, I showed off a simulation of combining a CompuCell and Tissue Forge simulation to make them interact. And that was with an environment that had both packages installed. And okay. yeah, and I, I don't want to give the impression that the only way that people can use Tissue Forge is in a new environment all by itself. You know, it's it's sort of like right. standard conda rules apply that you know the the cleanest, fastest way to use a conda package is in a new environment. Right. But I think for a newbie, it would be helpful to have this one as the default and say, if you want to run it in an environment with something else, do it a different way. Okay. Because, oh. because as, as Michael noted in his thing, his, his note here, 
the the problem I had was because I wound up trying to I didn't realize that I had to create a separate environment and it wasn't compatible with the the existing environment that I had because CompuCell 4.5 was there. Sure. Okay. I mean, I understand if I want to use them together, we have to fix that. But for for the point of just using Tissue Forge, it it looked to me like Tissue Forge wouldn't wouldn't load. So so. Okay. Uh, if I were smart, if I were more experienced, I would have understood what happened. But I but as a newbie, I wouldn't have any idea why it failed. Michael, you so you have Tissue Forge working with CompuSol four point four point one. Yeah, okay. I, I can get it to work with previous, but four or five is specifically the issue. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I think it's safe to assume as soon as we lift that arbitrary Python uh, limitation, that issue should go away. Actually, I had the same problem yesterday because uh, I try I installed it in um, an M that I had there with Python three point. Uh, nine something and it crashes so i say oh let's do the course now i create a clean environment with uh, 311 and it works so just to say it was uh, 3918 which uh, didn't work okay all right I have to mention that I'm trying to work it uh, through VS Code, so and using that as a kernel, so I did that. Oops. Okay. Well, thanks for the info. All right, we'll make a quick dead note. Okay. Um, so if you made it to the point that I made it to, then, um, you're up to speed and this next step is really only relevant if you want to work in a Jupyter notebook. Otherwise you can do everything that we're going to go through in just a basic Python script, assuming you know how to somehow create one and, and get it executing correctly. Um, so you want to install notebook and a few additional things in the exact same way we can do this with the following command so we'll do conda install again we'll do dash c conda forge and the packages that we want are notebook is jupyter notebook ipy widgets <clears throat> and IPy events. Conda install dash C conda forge and then notebook IPy widgets and IPy events. Run that. Go through the same procedure, should pull up another list of software that it will install upon your approval. And you can just confirm with a Y. And it'll get back to work.
Okay, so Jupiter launched all right. Great. Mine's taking a while. I'm surprised my laptop is faster than yours. We'll get there. Is it working for everybody? Anybody else besides Hayden having issues? Well, mine's slow. I think I had to restart it because I put in a, a typo. I said IP widgets instead of IPI widgets. That will happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll do a, a quick check while Bart's finishes up. So if you're at the same point as me, you can do this in Jupyter Notebook if you've jumped ahead or you're still just in the terminal. Uh, so if you're in the terminal, I'll start an interactive Python session by just typing Python and then return. If you're in Jupyter Notebook, you don't need to do this uh, first command that we just did. So Python commands to make sure that Tissue Forge installed and is working correctly. First thing we'll do is import the Tissue, for tissue Forge package, and that is uh, import tissue underscore forge, all lowercase. And I like to give it an alias of TF. So import Tissue Forge as TF. Press return. And then we can initialize the module with tf.init. No arguments. And if that didn't throw any errors, then tf.show, no arguments. You should see an empty universe. Hey, it worked. And you should find when you click and then drag, you can move the window around. If you have a wheel on your mouse, uh, you can roll the wheel to change the zoom. You can also change the zoom by clicking and holding uh, while holding down your control button. Uh, you can hold shift and drag. Uh, your uh, directional like your arrows should let you control the location of the camera as well on the keyboard. You can press R on your keyboard to reset the camera view. You can hold shift and then press F to get the front view, shift R to look at the right view, shift T to look at the top, shift B to look at the bottom. You hold shift and press your directional, your direction keys to rotate as well. But yeah, should be able to, if anything, sort of naively make this uh, universe dance around. That that didn't work. I mean, Which part? So I did import TF in it, TF show, it popped up the window, but then it was not responsive to, to um, uh, 
I'm trying the TF show window, TF show uh, cell again. And I have a broken, you know, I may have to re. Did I crash my kernel? Uh, in Jupyter, try tf.run instead of tf.show. Okay, here. So I have a I have the the window and it's got a run button and a pause button when I do tf show. But it doesn't respond to my mouse. If I click run, it doesn't do anything that I can see. Yeah. Yeah, because it's an empty universe. Um okay. when you click on the there are buttons for predefined camera views. Uh, okay. when you when you click on those, do you get different camera views? No, it doesn't doesn't respond. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, let's see. So you said tf.run instead of tf.show? Yeah. I'll try that. Yeah, Bart, that uh so Bart, does yours still run? Yeah, I think it was yeah. Uh let me see. Yes, it still runs though. So it's just yeah. a warning. Yeah, I've seen this one too. This this one's been a running and uh, it's 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 been a perplexing error that I, I think is either CUDA version specific or maybe card specific. Okay. Yeah, uh, this one I've not been able to. Yeah. Yeah, completely mm -hmm. identify. Yeah, on my laptop, I don't have a graphics card, so it's just uh, mm -hmm. whatever the Intel. Uh, but yeah, it rotates everything fine. Okay. James, did you ever did you have better luck with the run method? Uh I hit run. It executes the cell, but I don't see the window. Maybe it's hiding some. There, no, no, I don't, I don't get a win, I don't get the window. Right. If I do TF show, I do get the window, but it's not responding to my, it's not responding to my keyboard. Maybe I shouldn't hide it. Not in Jupyter notebooks. Did I, did I, did it, was there a specific kernel I had to run, Python 3 kernel, I assumed? Um, it should automatically load um, the conda, uh, the conda environments interpreter. Um, right, give me a second, let me, okay. All right. That's not link. Um, I can reproduce that, James. I've not seen this before. Oh, something else is.
import works, TF init works, TF show pops up that pops up the window, but doesn't let me do anything. You think there was some update of if I hit stop or stop and then I lose the window and it won't re it won't relaunch. If I try to run the TF show again, it won't let me do it. Well, I can I can use your other if you show me again how to do the other Python, I can try that. Oh, that's what I'm getting. Yeah, uh, not seen or heard of this. Well, that's frustrating. Sorry, everyone. Well, I'm I'm not worried if I can do it in the if I can do it in the other environment. Just have to show me again the commands I need to use from the from the Tonda window to get the to to, to launch the Python to the the other Python environment. All right, let me make another this. So if I go back to Anaconda, it shows a bunch of error messages. It does. What, uh, anything jump out at you? Uh, divide by zero error? Uh, that's what Bart was saying. Um... Connecting to kernel, da, da, da. shader compiled the compilation of fragment shader had divide by zero error. Yeah, that one's okay. That should be, it shouldn't prevent us from actually using it. Well, I, I'm fine using the, the command line one. I just, just have to show me what to do again. Okay. Like. <clears throat> well, we can. <clears throat> Um, so what we can do is we can still use Jupyter Notebook to write a Python script, and then we'll just execute our Python script from a terminal. That that's fine too. I just 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 touched this. Okay, so let's go back to so if you're in Jupyter, um, you can go back to um. The main Jupyter notebook screen where you can manage all of your files. Um, if you're working in an IDE or elsewhere, all we want to do is just create a new Python script to do some scripting. Uh, I'm doing this in Jupyter because I uh, assumed that James would be working in Jupyter. So I'm going to try to keep it as close to what he's doing as possible. Well, I mean, I'm fine using the the, the, the command line. I just, I thought since since Sharon uses the Jupyter Notebook one, I thought I would would try to match that. But let's see. Yeah, well, the command line one <clears throat> has its uses, but it's tough to iterate or like incrementally develop something. Right. So if we here here in Jupyter Notebook in the main navigation window we can click on new in the top right and then new file oh new file okay and you can name it whatever you want just make sure that it has a file suffix of dot py okay 
the call mine TF demo jag dot pi. Okay. All right. So we double click that and open that up. And we should just have a nice blank canvas on which to paint our tension tissue forge simulation. Okay, so let's just real quick. Yeah, hey, what's up? Um, are these slides shareable? Yes. Very quickly. I got the SSL thing solved. We'll try to catch up real quick. Oh, nice. Um, here, I'll give you the. Uh, so you've are you through the stage of creating a new environment? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you the the single line solution. All right. Yeah, once you've activated the environment, just use the command I just gave you, and that'll do everything up to this point. Okay. It also is not going to confirm with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so let's just start off our Python script by importing Tissue Forge, the very top import tissue underscore forge as TF. <clears throat> Let's just get through the stage of establishing uh, that we can execute this script um, and then incrementally develop it to do some interesting stuff. So import tissue forge as TF, return a couple of times, and then first we'll do tf.init, no arguments, and tf.show, no arguments. Now, the step that we all need to accomplish now is getting set up to execute this Python script, since apparently Jupyter Notebook is not working with Tissue Forge for at least some of us. Not that big of a deal, just annoying. Um, so we can do this with the following steps. So open a new command prompt or terminal or whatever. So where do I go to do that? Uh, so just open another command prompt like Oh in in the operating system. Okay. Yes. Not in not in my not in my Jupyter instance. Yeah. And first thing we'll want to do is change our working directory to the directory that contains the Python script that we just created. Um, everyone there so far? Yeah. Sorry, I defined the path. To...
James, you are you there? Well, actually, instead of it, it, it put it in the in the current directory. So, so my Jupyter notebook saved it locally to the so I don't actually have to do a CD. I don't think. Okay. <clears throat> cool. Okay, so let's assume everyone is where they're supposed to be. And the uh, next step is to activate the Conda environment that has the tissue porch package. Okay. Conda activate and then whatever I, whatever you named it as. What did I name mine as? Yeah. And if that worked, so you've CD'd to the directory that has the newly created Python script. You've activated the environment that has TissueForge installed into it. And so our last thing is to just execute it. So <coughs> the command to execute the script is Python. And then the name of the script. Hold on. So I forgot. I can't use the command, the command prompt. I have to go to the mini combo. Uh, okay. Here, while James gets there, can we take like a three minute break while I run to the restroom? Sure. Cool. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate your honesty. Good to hold it. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, so CD to the directory, activate the Conda environment, and then just yep. Python, and then the name of the Python script. Okay, fine. Okay, it pulled up the code that you're seeing. Uh, see. So it popped up the file. It popped up the file, but it doesn't seem to actually be executing it. In the command prompt, James, did you type Python and then the name of the script? Ah, sorry. It just, uh, I forgot we're not in a Python. We're not in a Python. When, okay, fine. Yes, that worked. Cool. And okay. now, now it does respond to my key keystrokes. Awesome. Okay, so the terminal that, or the command prompt that you're currently using, um, don't close it because this is how we will iteratively um, update our script and then execute new versions of our simulation. So when you close the tissue forge window, you should find that control is returned to your command prompt. Yep, that works. Now, when we make changes to our Python script, Right. We'll just save our changes, come back to our terminal, and then just reissue that last command, Python, and the name of our script, and we'll get an updated version of our simulation. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's take like three minutes. Let me use the restroom. How is it for everybody else? Working, not working? Yeah, it's working fine. My main issue was I was unfamiliar with the mini condom having to activate your environment. I missed that step. But everything else works now. Yeah, well, I'm not sure why why I can't do anything mm -hmm. from the, the Microsoft command window. I have to do it from the mini condom. Anyway. 
Oh, I'm, not, I'm using the mini conda command I mean, shell. Excuse me, I, I'm, I, I didn't try to do it from just a plain from the raw Microsoft command. Yeah, one. yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm gonna go get a cup of tea. All right. While he's out, I'm back right there. I know with the conda, sometimes if you put on compi cell, it can decide to redirect your conda window to the mini conda instance inside compi cell. And then that can lead to weird things occurring. Okay. I don't know exactly how that happens, but I've had it happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Really frustrating that Jupyter Notebook's not working right now. All of that. One of the joys of software development. So There's always a new bug waiting around every corner. Yes, there is. <laughs> All right. So um, if everyone is set up up to this point, this will be our general procedure for iteratively developing this. So we will make changes in our Python script, save them, switch back to our command prompt, and then just reissue that last command to observe updates. Okay. So let's uh, let me get the split screen going and work through this to build 
We're going to build a very small cell sorting simulation with some interactive uh, features and uh, get into the event system a little bit because I think that's one of the funnest aspects of developing with Tissue Forge. So uh, we are to here. Um, so our test that we put together is mostly accomplishing this first step. Um, the only uh, additional uh, code that we're going to add here to get started is we're going to go up to our init method, and we're going to use one of the many optional arguments to uh, impose some more details onto this tissue forge simulation. In this case, we're going to impose uh, what's called a cutoff, which in particle dynamics world is uh, the definition for the maximum distance over which two particles can interact. So in almost every particle dynamics simulation, um, particles only interact if they're within a certain distance, otherwise the computational cost just goes through the roof. Um, and Tissue Forge is no exception to that general rule. And so we have a cutoff and we specify a cutoff with the keyword argument cutoff. So we say cutoff equals, and we're gonna say three. Now, bear in mind that the default size of a tissue forge simulation is 10 by 10 by 10. No units applied or imposed. Arbitrary units of length. So our simulation size will be 10 by 10 by 10 unless we specify otherwise, and we are going to specify a cutoff of three. The default, I think, is I don't remember what the default is right now. Okay, otherwise, uh, we will observe no changes if we execute our simulation again. So let's just go ahead and proceed. Uh, and we're going to make some types. So our cell sorting simulation will have two types. Uh, we're going to call them types A and B. And uh, we're going to impose some overdamped dynamics and uh, a few other things. So let's just get right into it. So there are a couple of different ways to declare a tissue forge type. My favorite is with a class based specification in Python. And we do this uh, as follows. So let's define a particle type called a type. And in Python in general, you define a class with the keyword class, and then the name of that class, which we will call a type. And our definition for a type will inherit a base definition for a particle type. And we inherit that by starting some parentheses and specifying tf.particle type spec. Particle type spec is a template definition for particle type and our class definition for a type is just going to particularize some of the details of that template and everything else will be according to tissue forge defaults. And we're going to specify a couple of things. So one, um, we can specify the type of dynamics that's applied to particles of a particular type with a class property, a class attribute dynamics. And if we want to use overdamped dynamics, then we'll say dynamics equals tf dot overdamped. We're using overdamped because we're doing multicellular simulation and we'll assume that it's a highly viscous environment. So dynamics equals tf dot overdamped. Any particle of this type will have overdamped dynamics. 
uh, give our particles of this type uh, a particular radius. The default radius of particles is one. We're going to do a little bit smaller. We're going to say our radius equals 0 0.4. And we'll also uh, particularize the drag of our particles. Sharon and I have contentious discussions on this tissue forge detail fairly often. Tissue forge will indiscriminately use the property mass as the resistance to force irrespective of the type of dynamics. Mm -hmm. Oh, so when it should be drag, it should it's, it's instead of mass. That's right. The last of that. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Goodness knows we have enough misnamed things in computers, so I can't complain about this one. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, the last thing, uh, we're going to use the the simplest form of particularizing how particles of A type are visualized. We're going to use this with the class attribute style. We have all sorts of different ways that you can visualize particles of particular types and show scaling by velocity or you know, along a particular component or speed or force components, or you can show the uh, you can visualize the value of particular uh, uh, species, this idea of having cargo attached to particles all sorts of ways. Um, in our case, we're just gonna specify a constant color. And we do this by specifying that style is equal to a dictionary. And we'll just use one key, just color. And we'll make these particles red. So to summarize our particles of type, A type, We'll have overdamped dynamics. They'll have a radius equal to 0.4, a drag of 40, and they will be shaded as red. Now we're doing cell sorting, so let's make another cell type. Particle type, rather. <laughs> uh, this type we'll call B-type, and B-type will be the exact same in properties as a type, except that it will be they'll be visualized differently. So the same so the class definition, you inherit whatever goes in the parentheses after the type name. That's right. Okay, so it's a it's basically a recursive inheritance. That's right. Okay. So if we want if we want our new type B type to have all of the same attributes as A type, we just inherit directly from A type. And anything that we explicitly specify, we'll just overwrite anything specified on A type, just like how we explicitly overwrote details on our template particle type spec. In this case, we're just gonna say that B type is shown as blue. And if everyone's with me, then the last thing to do is to give these particle types or these particle type definitions to Tissue Forge and have Tissue Forge give us back the actual particle types that will be used in simulation. And we can do that with a method that's defined for the particle type spec. That method is called get, G-E-T. So if we want to get the actual instance that's created from the A-type definition and name it A, we can say A equals A-type dot get. This will create and register particle type according to our specification and then retrieve the object um, that is the actual particle type. Thanks, Michael. I was wondering why my indents were getting all weird. Okay, so likewise for the B type, we want to get the actual, well, if we want to actually register it and get the object back so we can build particles, 
Uh, we can say b equals b type dot get. Now, a minor footnote here. This architecture is universal in the process in which tissue forge is operating, which means that so long as you have this particle type definition anywhere in your code, you can always use this command to consistently get the same object. So I could be working in some super complicated, like detailed software and um, say want to retrieve the actual underlying object for my particle type long after I've actually gone through the process of constructing it. I can still use this get method on the particle type spec class to always consistently retrieve the same objects. None of that means anything to you, you can just ignore it. All right, uh, so this will uh, do nothing visually interesting in our simulation. So we can just proceed if everyone is up to this point, just shout out if uh, you're not there. Actually, let's just do a quick test real quick. Let's create a few more lines and let's just create a for loop. So I have a question. Yeah. If, is there, is, where is my Python console? In other words, if I do a print statement, where does it show up? It'll show up in the, the <clears throat> prompt where you execute it. Um, it didn't. Oh, here it is. Okay, I suck. So, okay, let's try again here. Yeah, that one worked. Does it get to the other commands after the show, or does the show have to be moved after those commands? The show is a blocking call. So I do need to move the show at later if I want to execute those earlier commands. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I forgot about that detail. <laughs> yeah. You'll definitely want to have tf.show as your last line. Sorry, I forgot to add some space between. So we do tf.init, define all of our particle types, and then call tf.show. So that explained why I wasn't I wasn't seeing the output because it was it was below the show. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. So if we want to do a quick test to make sure that all of this is working so far. I'm just gonna add a a quick command between getting our particle types and showing our simulation. Just say something like a dot factory one thousand. Then go back to your command prompt, execute your simulation. Yeah. Get a thousand randomly distributed particles of type A shown as red. Neat. Cool. All right, we're not actually going to use that factory uh, method. Uh, just doing a quick test there to make sure everything's working so far. All right, so if you tried that. Hey, you, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I had a question. Yeah. It's not showing, uh, I'm getting the tissue forge has no attribute over Dan. Did I? Uh, uh, is just the O capitalized? Yeah. I have it like this. Let's see. Um, isn't that right? Uh, yeah. Um, it's the the capitalized D. We can lowercase that. The what is? So, it's, with how you've written over damped, 
there's a capital line. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. <sighs> All right. So if uh, everyone's there, <clears throat> then uh, we can make some potentials and to start specifying some cell sorting. And we're going to use uh, Moore's potential. Real quick, were we supposed to see anything when we ran the program? Uh, if, well, see anything is in like C particles. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you added the this a dot factory call. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you didn't, then no. So this should show a thousand randomly distributed red particles. Without it, you won't actually see any changes in the simulation. Because no objects have yet been created. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, I'm caught up. Well, <clears throat> okay, so without diving into the details here, Believe me when I say that a Moore's potential is a pretty good representation of volume exclusion and adhesion. Um, and if you disagree with that, that's totally fine. If you don't care, that's also fine. What's important here is that uh, Tissue Forge provides a built-in implementation of the Moore's potential, which can be useful for simulating uh, particle-based representations of cell sorting. And uh, we can use this built-in implementation of the Morse potential to create instances of this equation with particular parameters as objects. And we are going to do that to uh, do differential adhesion. Um, and we can do this as follows. So in general, uh, the built-in potential functions are available to create potential objects on the potential class. TF dot potential. This is the class of all potential objects in Tissue Forge. And the potential class has class methods to quickly create these different built in potential function implementations. In this case, to quickly create a Morse potential, you can say TF dot potential dot Morse and just provide the parameters. And it will return a potential object with this equation and your parameters implemented. So in this case, we want to specify adhesion uh, and volume exclusion on the basis of different types of particle pairs. I want to have adhesion for particles of types A and A when in contact pairs of particles in contact with types B and B, and then the third possible combination of particle types A and B. We're going to say uh, for adhesion between A and A particle types, we'll create a corresponding potential pot underscore AA. Pot AA equals TF dot potential dot mores, and we're just going to fill out our two model parameters, D and A. For pot AA, we'll say D equals three and A equals five. And then we will specify cutoff, minimum and maximum cutoff, uh, cutoff distance is not the correct term. We'll specify the range over which this potential can be applied in terms of relative distances of particles. And by that, I mean, with respect to the surface to surface distance of two particles, over what distances can this potential be applied? So when we say a minimum on the range of negative 0 0.8, this potential can be applied up to a nearness of an interpenetration distance of 0 0.8. This is not required information, um, but improves 
uh, stability and performance. So let's just fill these out. The max is uh, the same idea, but for a maximum distance. So this, this in a sense, is a philosophical choice. I understand why you made it this way, but it makes the definition of cell types a little more complicated because like in CompuCell, interactions live in the model, in the model environment. Not, they're not attributes of the object itself. In other words, well, I think I'm sort of jumping ahead. In other words, when you do TF bind, uh, you're attaching it between objects of class type A and A. Whereas uh -huh. you might want to create a general potential that belongs to all objects of class A that says, do this to any target, not just to, to, to target a particular type. Because you might want to actually have the, have the potential belong, the interaction potential belong to the object. Here it seems to live in it lives in the it lives in the sort of a watcher in the background. Yeah, it's it's possible to construct a definition like that. Um, for example, this uh, A type class definition yeah. can be arbitrarily expanded to include more, um, say, model features. One of which right. could be something like. Um, say a method um, called like impose distance. Right. And when this method is called, it could ask for ask tissue forge for all of the types of particles that exist in the simulation and bind this potential between all of them. But yeah, an interaction on just all particles is not something that is natively supported yeah it's tricky because an interaction when you don't know what your counterparty is is a hard thing to define on the other hand if you want to define a cell type as a, as a template you sort of have to be able to do that mm. and i'm not I'm, I'm i'm just i wonder how the other other center models handle that i wonder how physicel handles that if you have to if you have Two, two, two cells that have incompatible potentials, what does it do? Oh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, that was a Michael question. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being talked about, but I can't remember the answer off the top of my head. I think it's got something to do with defaults. I think yeah, well, it has out. to be some default, yeah. but, but anyway. Okay, for today, it's just, but it just, it's just, Philosophically, we, we're making the same. Uh, you're making the same decision Comptrasol made for the same reason, and so it's interesting to see that. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, we can we can discuss that more later. Um. Because I I am somewhat opinionated on that, but I don't want to I don't want to derail us. So let's fill out the the template here. So the idea here is that adhesion between particles of A and A or of B and B is the same, whereas heterotypic adhesion is weaker. And we do this by having uh, our parameter D, the magnitude of the potential, be an order of magnitude lower for heterotypic adhesion. So that's the idea. You could also write this with just two potentials and say, pot, uh, say homotypic and pot heterotypic. I kind of tried to spell it out for a, a beginner workshop. Um, but having created all of those potentials or other potentials that you may also be interested in including, generally you can apply these potentials to particles of pairs of types using tf.bind.types. Now, types is one method in the bind submodule. Binding interactions is specifying that there is an interaction between certain classes of objects or types of objects according to either a potential or a force or otherwise. In general, this is referred to as binding, and you can specify the, say, class of objects that are interacting with various functions in the bind module. 
Here we're specifying interactions on the basis of pairs of types. And we first state which potential we are um, assigning. And then the two pairs of types. In this case, we say that particles of types A and A interact according to this potential pot AA. Likewise, B and B type or pot BB and pot A. This much we can test. If we again add, say, a test function that just randomly adds particles. So if you add again our a dot factory and just pass an integer of 1000, go back to execute, you should find that you again get 1000 randomly distributed red particles. <clears throat> if you're using tf.show, this pulls up the window but does not automatically start executing the simulation. You can pause or resume the simulation with your space bar. So if I press my space bar, now I get motion. And as I browse around a little bit, I start to see some actual aggregation. Is there any difference between TF show and TF run? Does TF show just start paused or is there a, another difference? Uh, no differences except that TF show pulls up the window, pause TF.run pulls up the window, executing. In Jupyter, it depends on the context. In Jupyter, it's a little bit different. And the default is periodic boundary conditions? That's right. So this is, it worked amazing, just like that. Yeah, boundary conditions are a really common use case of additional arguments in the init method. Right. Um, they yeah, can specify pre-slip, no-slip uh, boundary conditions. You can also let Tissue Forge know that you plan on assigning potential interactions between particles and boundaries. So you can bind potential interactions to particles and specific boundaries. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a bunch of fairly exotic things that you can do with boundary conditions. I really appreciate you walking me through the, 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 the process here because looking at the code raw, it's not so obvious what you're doing. But when you walk through it this way, it's very it's a very simple. It's huh. just a question of understanding what all of the, each of these methods is doing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, the, it's the real challenge of declarative specification. Yeah. Yeah. So so is is it truly declarative? In other words, if I put factory before the other stuff, will it give me the same result? Uh, yep. Yeah, you can try that out. The only real constraint here is that your particle types must be registered before you can create particles. Sure, a, a dot won't work if A doesn't exist. So. Exactly. But, 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 but where I'm defining the potentials, for example, they don't have to be defined before I create the particle instances. Yeah, let's try it. So I put, uh, I moved my factory method to before creating the potentials. And uh, so here we go, same outcome. I'll also point out that there is throttling on interactive execution. Um, so if you pull up uh, like a system monitor, you'll find that the system utilization is like your actual utilization of resources is probably pretty low for the simulation um, because there's a frame rate that's imposed when executing interactively to 30 frames per second. Whereas if you execute this headless, you know, the uh, the brakes are, are removed and this gets lightning fast. 
So this is definitely not the uh, peak performance in terms of the actual runtime to accomplish this simulation. So how would you do that? Um, would you just uh, not put the show on there or do you put the show on after it's run for so long? Or how do you just give them the final result after say, whatever, 10 seconds or something? Sure. Yeah, so there's a, a couple of modalities here. In general, you can advance a simulation a number of steps with tf.step okay. and specify the period of simulation time to execute. Now, the default time step in Tissue Forge is 0 0.01, no units. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I say um, tf.step one, that'll execute a hundred steps before showing. Okay. And we should see that. Actually, let's step that up a little bit. Let's do, let's do 10. So this will be a thousand simulation steps. Yeah. Okay. This is great. So you can play with the interaction energies really easily by just changing those D parameters and the A parameters. That's right. And A is the interaction is basically the the, the radius of the particle in the in the Morse potential. That's the uh, what do they call that? The, the minimum of the the minimum of the potential. It's the what width? What do they call that? There's a name for it. I can see. I can. I should be able to see by changing it and seeing what happens to the to the uh, simulation. Yeah, you should. You should find greater steepness in the the interaction. So the the forces can act with a greater magnitude, but will do so over a sharper distance. Yeah. So I see if I make the, the D value, the, the, the potential bigger for blue, they're more clustered, to, they cluster tighter together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, now let's, uh, let's do forces because forces have uh, an additional bit of support for interaction that can be a, a lot of fun to mess with in steering a simulation that currently are not naturally supported by potentials. And I want to include this detail because I think it's fun. So uh, creating forces can be done. Or we can get rid of our factory method for now. Creating forces and similarly to creating potentials. So we can create a force using the actual force class, um, which is the uh, base class definition for all forces in Tissue Forge. Um, and there are a few built-in force types, like a uh, Ray or a, what a Berenson thermostat. Uh, most commonly, I think, uh, something like a Gaussian force. Um, which can be created with class method random. tf.force.random and and specify the mean magnitude of the force with the keyword argument mean and the standard deviation of the force with the keyword argument STD. And this will return a tissue forge force object according to that specification. So the direction of the random force is randomly selected and then the magnitude is selected according to a Gaussian distribution. And this can be bound to particles by type similarly to the potentials, except in this case, forces are bound to uh, just particle types and not pairs of types. So what we're going to say is that uh, we have a random force 
that is applied first to all particles of type A with tf.bind.force. We have the force that we want to bind, and then the particle type to which the force should be bound. This is also totally declarative, so it's uh, order independent subject to basic Python rules. You can't use an object you can't you haven't created yet, but otherwise totally order independent. So tf.bind.force and give our particles of type B uh, that same random force. And if we then go back to um, say creating some random particles should now find that they bump around a bit. Yeah, there you go. Now you can do all sorts of interesting things like ask what is the sensitivity of the rate of like cell sorting to um, say the noise in the motion of the individual particles. Yes, yeah, so the question would be uh, how do I, how do I, what kind of metrics can I use to analyze it? find out where the cells are, what the core, is there something that will turn a correlation function or a neighborhood or something like that for a particle? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, so those are the two main classes of objects that can be bound to particles by types or pairs of types, potentials and forces. <clears throat> and again, you can create your own custom potentials. You can have multiple potentials and then add them together um, to bind to, to particle types. Um, same with forces, you can actually have a Python callback function that's used um, as um, the underlying calculation of the force acting on particles. Sky's the limit, but this is the, the basic procedure. If, you know, for the force, that bind up force, say for particle B, can you just multiply our force by a scalar or do you have to look up what what's the return values? Uh, you would need to um, either... adjust it there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So these result in members on the created force object. Um, and those members can be changed at runtime. So you could, for example, say R force A and R force B, assign R force A to A and R force B to B, and then say later, R force B dot mean say times equals 10 or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if we have time, we're actually going to do a little bit of that. All right. So next, let's go with the. Um, well, let's start building towards actually doing a little bit of interactive simulation. So um, what we want to do is start defining some simple functions um, to accomplish procedures in our simulation in a compact way. And by that, I mean, I wanna have like say a well-defined function that when we call it, uh, a certain amount of particles of each type is created. In this case, uh, let's define a function that when called just creates uh, a thousand of each particle type um, and places them randomly in the simulation. So one of the key features here to bear in mind is that um, as we've already seen a little bit in the prototyping, there's a factory method on these particle types um, to quickly create um, you know, lots of particles and place them randomly in there other additional features that can be used with that, but sort of default standard way to create a particle is to actually use the particle type like a function. By that, what I mean is that if I take, take my A type object and call it like a function, 
that'll create a part of it. If I specify a position, it'll create a particle at that position. If I also specify a velocity, it'll create a particle at that position with that velocity and a bunch of other additional features. But in general, we'll do all of this by using our particle types as functions and it will create particles of corresponding type. So let's make a simple method, def create particles. I always wanna have standard amounts of particles that are created when this is called uh, and we'll say a thousand per particle type. So we'll say declare some variables, a count equals 1000 and b count equals 1000 and say that those variables are used every time this new function is called to create particles of uh, the value of those variables. So let's create some for loops inside our new function say for some dummy variable in range of a count, and then just call a. Then for b, for some dummy variable in range of b count, b. Now we're going through the additional step of putting these in functions, all good programming aside, to be able to do the interactive type stuff that uh, I have planned for this, although we are desperately running out of time. But we should find that after defining this function and then actually calling it immediately thereafter, go back and call our script. We got to pluralize particles. Thanks. I've got 2,000 particles, 1,000 of each for each type, and uh, randomly distributed and they will start aggregating and sorting. Right, since it's already after five, let's create one more method really quickly and then do some events. So <clears throat> for the sake of the exercise, trust me when I say that we want to create another function that destroys all the particles. call that method or that function destroy particles. <clears throat> I think I actually have this mapped out. Yeah. What we want to do is set up a couple of callbacks up for our keyboard so that we can destroy and then create particles on demand according to keyboard um, like keys key presses. So can create and destroy particles anytime we want in simulation. Um, and in general, we have um, handle to a particle, just to say something like a safe reference to refer to a particular particle in simulation. Each particle handle has a method destroy that will destroy the underlying particle of that handle. We can get all of the particles of a particular type or of the entire universe in a number of different ways. The safe way to iterate over all of the particles of a particular type and destroy them without causing any sort of programmatic or 
say memory issues is as follows. Actually, let me demo this. In general, you can iterate over all the particles of a type like this for lowercase a in uppercase a. This will iterate over every particle of type a. For p and tf.universe.particles, will iterate over every particle in the universe. A safe way to create a copy of all of the particles of a particular type so that we can destroy them is as follows. For a in list of a.items, and then a.destroy. That'll iterate over and destroy every particle of type A. Same for B, for B in list of B.items, B.destroy. So let's assume that that works and just move on to the fun stuff. I'm going to set up some keyboard callbacks. So there are a number of different events ways to inject custom Python code into a simulation, and that's not specific to Python. You can do the same in C or C++. You can give TissueForge your own code to execute along with a simulation according to different criteria. It's a regular, like, specified frequency or selecting particles at random or all sorts of different things. The one that we're interested in is to call a function when uh, a key is pressed on the keyboard. And we can do this as follows. So let's define uh, a function that will handle all of the keystrokes that uh, could be pressed on the keyboard. And we'll define this as a function key underscore CB. And when Tissue Ford uses a callback to handle keystrokes, it passes one object to it that gives you the information about what key was pressed on the keyboard. And that is uh, a key event object that is in the event module of TissueForge. So when we register this function with TissueForge and say, use this to handle keystrokes, every time TissueForge detects a keystroke, it will give our function this key event, an instance of this key event, and that's what we can use to determine what, what key was pressed and how to respond. And really what we want to do is just set up a key on our keyboard to call either create particles or destroy particles. That's as far as we're going to demonstrate for now, since we're running short on time. So very quickly, with this key event object, we can query what was the key that was pressed on the keyboard with its attribute key name. And we can say if e dot key name equals something, then do something. And in this case, we can start by creating a uh, an assignment to reset our simulation, which is to say to destroy everything in it and then create particles again, you can do this in response to pressing the key C on our keyboard. If, if C is pressed on the keyboard, destroy particles, and then create particles. And that's the general form for assigning a keyboard callback uh, to Tissue Forge. Uh, and we can uh, give Tissue Forge our keyboard callback with tf.event.on underscore keypress and just pass the name of the function. Now, some of the other different types of events, like calling a function at a regular um, frequency or according to other criteria, they have 
you know, slightly different forms for handling, um, you know, the appropriate information. But in general, tf.event, this event module has all of the public facing functions to give tissue forge custom functions to be used in different ways as a simulation is being executed. So let's try this. You actually, you made it this far and try it out. Otherwise, just let's see how well I wrote my code. Yep, it works. Amazing. C, 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 C. C, 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 C. Yep, it works. Neat. And I mean, you can, can start expanding the functionality pretty rapidly. So... I, like I, know you're, I know you're tired, but the one, what if I want to know where my cells are? Uh, I tried I tried putting in an iterate over my cell list, and then I tried to print something about the cells, and I didn't get anything. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I just <laughs> just typed tf.university. Okay, so if, for example, I wanted to know where all the uh, positions of my particles are. Um, in general, you can iterate over um, all of the particles in the universe by iterating over tf.universe.particles. Again, as before, you can do the same with uh, by particle type. You can also reference particles individually by unique IDs. So how do I get the list of attributes? I tried during the particle, I, the particle handle, and it didn't do anything. Did you print the dir? Yes. <laughs> um, well, besides the API docs that have all of them listed and described. Okay. Um, for this particular use case, if I wanted to say print the ID and position of each particle on demand, say when I press Right. I would do as such mm -hmm. p and tf.universe.particles and then just print p.id and p.position. Yeah, I just I, I was hoping I, I didn't have to look up what all the what all the what all the attributes were, but that's fine. Um I wonder if I wonder if there's something weird with print in my I'm sorry. If you had as good of luck as I did, then you should see something like what's printed out on mine when I press P. Function is called. All of my requested prints occur when I press P on my keyboard, and then the simulation goes back to its own business. No, so my console output is going to somewhere strange. I don't get I don't get a print. It's funny, I put a print hello at the very beginning. That prints. But nothing later prints. No prints. The the on C. Do you have all of this specified before you call tf.show? Yes. Mm. The 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 C command works, but the P command was not. Let me try again. It's working for me. The P command doesn't print. Uh, you want to trade me screen shares real quick? Okay, sure. I'm sure I'm doing just some doing something stupid. Um, but it's fine. So here's my code. And I say print. I mean, the print dir, I don't expect, but the print, this is the print. Is that, oh, so I got particles wrong. That's good. 
didn't throw an error on that particles. Maybe that was all that was wrong. Uh, and then position is misspelled. I noticed that if you ty have typos, that it'll give you in the in the console. It says, "Did you did you mean to type this instead?" Yeah, which is sort of nice. Okay, so let's see. So let me stop this. Maybe it was just that, but that print dir that print dir list didn't work. Um, not sure. Okay, so let's run this. C works. Let's see. P. Yep. Great. Okay. So why does this not work? Um, it should. I don't get that list of. I'd expect two thousand lines of junk from that, or a thousand lines of junk because I have a thousand A's. Things to work for me. Okay, but anyway, it works here, so I'm I'm happy. I'm. Let me try. Let me try. Print dir of a. Uh, well, p in this case. Sorry, p here. Sorry, p. Okay. You know, again, I'm. It's sort of. I'm sort of embarrassed because looking at this code. For myself, I found it not intuitive at all. But when you walk through it, the way when you build it up step by step, it really is quite it is quite natural. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't have a. I don't have a, anything to say except that that. Uh, okay, let's see if I get my dir. All right. It always opens the it always opens the the cur the console on the other screen. Yep, there we go. It worked. So I'm not sure what I did wrong there, but anyway. Just, uh... Yeah, I don't know. What the and maybe it's something weird to do with this copy operation, the list of a dot items. If you replace list of a dot items, just replace all of that with a. See if that works. Just in a. A in a. Yeah. Try that. Just close the tissue forge window. I have to find it to close it. Okay. Open it back here. Run. Print. Except now it's hard to tell because I have I should get rid of <laughs> I have to get rid of I have to get rid of it here. Yeah. Uh, Where is it? Oh. Hiding behind the hiding behind the uh no, it did not it did not execute that for didn't print anything. Yeah, that's weird. I'm executing the exact same code and, and getting that information to print. It's got to be directing it somewhere else. Yeah, it worked that time. <clears throat> Where? No, it's, it's not giving me the dir. It's giving me the position. Uh -oh. Okay. Gotcha. But and when I put the print inside of the inside of the callback, it's okay. But when it's in the in the bare Python sequence, it doesn't it doesn't execute. Hmm. And my my guess is that somehow that this print is being di directed some except that first I put this print hello that that prints. 
So I don't understand why that doesn't that that anyway doesn't. Uh, it's not a big deal. I didn't mean to 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 take keep people a long time, but but that helps a lot. You know me, endure. I like to. That's my manual. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so let me let's see if this. Yeah. Okay. So one last thing. Uh, I mean, there are a bunch of other. So if I wanted to do, I guess the other question is, if I wanted to plot something in real time, so I, so I want to use Matplotlib and plot something as it's running, mm -hmm. uh, is there something where I can time step it? Or Yeah, so there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, to I think there's an example of this somewhere in the, the repo. Um, so if, for example, you wanted to have a, a simulation executing in real time and a plot of date, you know, some measure of the data um, that also updates in real time, then you would create, say, like a matplotlib figure right. And, right. Then, um, and then implement a an event that is executed at a regular frequency where that event updates the data in the figure. So there'd be something like an event on time or on something time. else. Yeah. That's right. Yep, on time, uh, specifying the function to call and at what frequency. And that function goes and gets and analyzes whatever simulation data you might be interested in and then updates whatever figures you've created elsewhere. Great. Okay. Um, it's nice to be able to have a live plot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, rendering figures either on demand with keyboard callbacks or at a regular frequency, you know, with, with timed events. Uh, yeah. Rendering, exporting simulation data to file, uh, you know, all the, I guess, the, the main procedures that, uh, you would want in, uh, in a simulation, or at least all the ones I could think of. Well, and do people, anybody else have questions? I know for TJ, it's already late. Mine, I guess it would be only if, uh, so the particles are rigid by definition. Uh, the particles are rigid. Can they be squashed or made uh, more or less stiff? Say, yeah, it's the those interactions are all according to the potentials that you define. So you can um, you can define interactions according to like a representation of hard spheres, so that when they collide, it's like two marbles hitting, or with a these, you know, like a Leonard Jones potential or like the Moore's potential that we use today, you can make them in, interpenetrate, you know, with a, a lot or a little resistance, you know, just sort of arbitrarily. What was the dynamics for Newtonian? Instead of overdamp, what was it called? Oh, it's Newtonian, but the Newtonian is the default. So you can just specify nothing. There's a, it's a good chance that'll make your simulation go crazy. Is there a good example of how to apply uh, Monte Carlo or you know, Markov chain processes to like individual particles? So they'll all take a random probability. Um, yeah. Um, Actually, maybe maybe one of the the better ones is one that is featured in the paper. Um, so it's a an implementation of uh, colonic crypt simulation developed by uh, with James Osborne and a few others, maybe Philip Maney. Um, but that uh, that simulation does agent based. It has an agent-based model with stochastic differentiation and proliferation. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. 
Well, this was a super helpful lesson. I recorded it, so maybe we should put if if we. I'm sure you have your other one up online, but maybe we can put this one up somewhere too. <laughs> at lightly TJ, at. TJ, do you have these slides available somewhere? I uh, I can share them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I. Uh, well, I can. I'll just. Yeah, I can send a link where everyone can download. Um, okay, thank you. Just make a list of who all I should send the link to. Well, I I definitely want to go through them. And the the slides have definitely a better description than uh, of like specific details than uh, than what we were able to get through. And there are more. Um, more walkthrough examples and the, uh, you know, well, kind of in exploring a little bit like what can be done with the events uh, that we just kind of ran out of time for. And bonded interactions. That would be really helpful. Yeah, the, <laughs> there's. I mean, this this simulation is about the simplest. It is, it is near near the simplest. It's the simplest I could really come up with for multicellular simulation for sure. I mean, the one I really want is just to start out with the two 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 particles on a spring, pull on them and plot the stress strain relation, and then have a linear chain and pull on it and make stress strain, then make a square, uh, solid material and pull on it and get the stress strain. Uh, all the things that I wanted Sharon to do from the beginning that she didn't ever do, so that I can actually learn what the material properties are of these things. So I know how to build a material with the properties I want. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's my dream of being able to do that. Because CompuCell is not so good. We can do it, but it's sort of clunky in CompuCell. And here, that should be the most natural thing you can do to build solid, solid bones. Yeah, yeah, well, there's a... There's a demo uh, in the examples with uh, the deformation of a linear elastic material with perfectly brittle fracture. I think maybe I showed that one off to you right after I developed it. Yeah, that's a pretty simulation. But I'd sort of like to have a Jupyter notebook that builds step by step, builds the the you know, progressively more complex solid materials. I think that would be a really great set of demos for sort of teaching in a mechanical engineering class, for example. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Other people have questions? You've been f fantastically patient, TJ. Thank you so much. No, this was great. I mean, everyone, everyone uh, made it all the way to the the finish line that we designed ad hoc to not go to dinner. Couldn't be happier without win, I'd say. Well, Lorenzo's the one who's really easy. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's 1030 for him. No, 1130. No, 1030. Uh, it's 1030. 1030. No, it was, yeah. it was very fun. So it kept me awake. I really like it. <laughs> Thanks, TJ. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Yeah, Thanks. my pleasure. Thanks, Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.